You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. I have uh, Brett Schell, the founder of Cold Boar Technology. And the website is Cold Boar Technology. Boar is B-O-R-E. So, Brett, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah, tell me, what's uh, the premise of Cold Boar? Uh, okay, so I'll give you, a, it's easiest to maybe describe a quick, uh, very brief history of how we got there, and that kind of de- will describe what it is that we're doing today. So, okay. uh, my background was largely in uh, drilling. Uh, so I spent six or seven years uh, working on drilling rigs and, uh, you know, from lease hand all the way up to driller. And then I left the field and came in and started doing some private equity and technology company financing uh, for about eight years. Um, and then we started Cold Boar. So uh, initially we were developing drilling tools because that was my world. Um, once we brought the finance and the, the experience, the expertise in the, in the given field of oil and gas together, we said, you know, there's a bunch of problems in drilling we're going to try to address. Let's look at that. That was a pre downturn for us. So we started developing uh, drilling, acoustic drilling telemetry tools. Um, after the big downturn, we had to abandon that pretty quickly because nobody was interested in drilling anymore. And that led us over to a completion location. Um, one of our tools was an acoustic unit. And I was out there asking um, the completion guys, uh, you know, I told them, I have this uh, really high resolution tool gathering a lot of data. I need an operating system or, you know, your operating computer to plug into so I can, you know, give you guys that data on the frac location. And the reason why I was of that understanding that they would have something like that is on the drilling side, um, we have what's called a PASON unit in all of our rigs. And uh, it's just a computer that gathers all the data from the rig and displays relevant info for the driller. And so I assumed they would have an ECR or electronic completions recorder uh, out on a completion location that did something similar, but for fracking. Um, you know, my assumption was based on that because okay. fracking is quite quite a bit more expensive than drilling, and there's a bunch of services out there, not just one, um, so a lot more complicated. And so I just assumed that that would exist, uh, and it did not exist. So that's essentially what we do now. The smart pad is the world's first electronic completions recorder. Well, uh, you know, for people that aren't experienced with drilling, you know, what are some of the um, what are some of the things that make it difficult? What kinds of things need to be stabilized or addressed or lubricated or, you know, what are some of the mechanics of it that, uh, you know, make it complicated? Uh, well, so for, for drilling, you mean like for the actual operation of drilling? Yeah. You know, just to give a little bit more background on the technology and how it, uh, affects the drilling process positively, you know, what are some of the things that, uh, people that drill have to deal with, you know, what are some of the, you know, the public may not know. So that's why I want to give a little more context around, uh, what the technology does. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. This brings up. So let me. This is a good opportunity for me to provide some clarity. So, um, uh, the nothing we do has to do with anything to do with drilling itself, right? We're all on the fracking side now, but there it is a very okay. common question that I get um, because we were in the world of downhole drilling tools before that whole downturn happened. So this is a really good opportunity, actually, for me, if you don't mind asking that question, a lot of people do assume we're still in the acoustic drilling side of things, um, when in fact, the smart pad is 100% um, on a frac location now. So nothing to do with drilling, um, except for the fact that I came from that world and the understanding that the frac location was missing, basically the recording operating system to run a frac location. Uh, and that came from the drilling world. So all of those downhole drilling parameters that you'd be talking about that we could go into for, for hours, we're, are all brought up to an operating system. Um, and the frac, the frac side of the business is only, you know, you give it 15 years old, would probably be generous. Um, the drilling side is 100 years old. 
So the frack side doesn't have a lot of the operating systems or the IoT driven software that drilling has. And that's where we fit. So I, I mean, I, I'm very happy to go in and discuss uh, drilling technicalities with you if you want, but that wouldn't be really applicable to the smart pad. No, that's fine. So how does fracking work? You know, just give me like a, a basic understanding of what happens when you frack. Sure. So fracking is just the process. So after you drill a well, the, the drilling rig will leave. And then the frack, the frack's uh, purpose is to go and hook up a bunch of high pressure pumps and pump a bunch of fluid and prop it down into that well and just fracture the rock. This releases more of the hydrocarbon, right? Um, so it just breaks it all up down hole and lets the well flow better. Um, that's a very, very um, layman term description of what happens. It's quite complicated procedure. Um, and it involves uh, a lot of services. So usually four or five major service companies. So the operator uh, will own the location and they will, they will contract all these different service companies to come out there. And the different service companies have to work together um, to accomplish what's called a zipper frack. So um, on a pad, you'll have, let's call it four wells to keep it easy. Um, and they'll want to do a different uh, service operation to any one of those four wells all simultaneously to keep the flow happening, right? So there's what's called wireline. They'll maybe run a wireline in on well A, and they could be doing a frack on well B, and they could call coil in to work on well C all at the same time. Um, if one of those operations goes longer than expected or holds up uh, their operation, then it starts the daisy chain effect where it's really hard for the operator to track and understand what's going on out on that pad now. It starts to become a mess really quick. Um, and I think the the big thing over the problem with frack right now or the, with the completions industry is that that whole really complicated operation, the operators are trying to keep track of it manually. So they they are they are literally using notebooks and Excel sheets to gather data from all these different service companies to try and write it down by hand who started what operation at what time, when they moved, when this company moved to here, when that happened, and they're then they're moving it through their companies manually. So that is where we stepped in and said, hold on, we should have IoT driven software like every other industry in the world does, tracking all these operations automatically. And then we can ingest all of the other five or six service companies, um, different data sets, combine them into one, and we can attach that to the operational workflow that we're capturing from the sensors. And then after that, the world's your oyster. That data is now normalized. It can be moved through your business from different departments seamlessly without anyone touching it. So that's really the process of fracking, uh, the big problem with fracking now, and then our solution that we've kind of derived. Oh, okay. So what kinds of data? I mean, do most operators not even collect data? They just do it, and if problems come up during the process, they they fix them and they don't keep any data? Or is it that they keep data, they don't know what to do with it? What kinds of data? Yeah, I'd say it's more that one. So they do track stuff. Like, they'll, 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 they track you know, we started this operation at 10 a.m. Let's call it fracking, and we fracked until 11. Um, but that's a that's a person watching and writing that down, either in Excel or in their notebook. And then if they have a problem, they write it down. Uh, you know, oh, we had a problem with a valve at 10:15, and we fixed it by 10:30. But you can see where it starts to become a, a thumbnail type situation because a human's gathering that data. It's not precise, right? So there's, you know, at 10,000 bucks an hour, um, when you have four wells going with four different service companies and hundreds of operations happening a day and you have a problem with 20% of them and each one of those problems lasts 10 or 15 minutes and you need to track that accurately. The difference in tracking it with a human, thumbnailing it and having sensors that are tracking everything by the second and organizing that data and then producing reports, that can be the difference of hundreds of thousands of dollars on a pad, right? Just a, just a few minutes here and there that you are not tracking with low resolution manual data capture. Well, okay. So um, do you have your technology installed in various fracking operations? Because, you know, once you do, I don't know if you're privy to any of the data, but you'd start to see in a whole, you know, on a large scale, what goes on with a lot of operations and the problems. And it would make you the experts in the industry. Because like, I'm sure a lot of operations don't even know, hmm, I didn't realize that this problem X comes up so often. And it uh, tends to cause, you know, an hour delay every two months or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we operators are really smart. Um, they obviously have been doing this a long time and they've got their operations. Uh, they understand their operations fairly well. Um, what this what the high resolution 
data does though is exactly what you said. It allows it to be consumable. Like you had made mention that, you know, what's one of the problems? Do they not do anything with the data after? That's, that is very much true in a lot of cases. Um, because if you have, you know, if you're gathering it manually and then you have people going through data to try and make assertions or assumptions about what that data means, it's very arduous and it takes a lot of people a lot of time. So typically, you know, they'll capture the really big problems, uh, like, oh, we see this or we see that. But when you implement a system like this, you, you nailed it on the head. You know, there, there are dozens of smaller situations that start to pop up, like, uh, you know, other little issues that start to rear their head. And it typically, in our experience, tends to come up a lot more often than what was initially thought. And then they start to be able, you know, as the old saying goes, if you don't track it, you can't improve it, right? So right. If, you're, if you're not aware of all of these little problems that are coming up that you think are little, um, because, you know, you can't pay enough people to go through the data fast enough to get a handle on it. And then, you know, you're cruised off to the next pad. Um, you're never going to know about these things. But what, what every other industry in the world, and, and to be honest, completion is behind on, is doing is that they have switched over to sensors that drive software. And then you just take the logic of what it is you may be looking for, put it into the software, and it produces 10 times the results you could ever get out of humans in a blink of an eye. And what that does is allow you then to start really taking a look at summaries of the data. And those summaries of data start to show where inefficiencies are, efficiencies can be gained, processes can be changed. And it, quite frankly, allows you to reduce the infrastructure of your company all while increasing the output of what it is you're starting to understand about your operation. So what kind of, um, I mean, how many places do you have your uh, software installed in and what kind of interesting things are you seeing? Yeah, so I think, so we're installed, we're working with, we've worked we've worked with 20 or so of the major operators. We are building equipment furiously. We are developing furiously. We are uh, one of those small to mid-sized uh, companies that is, you know, working with some of the biggest companies in the world now. So as their scaling demands start to come in, um, everything gets pretty heavy on our plate. Uh, but we're continuously at any one time working with five or six of them and then moving to deploying with 10 to 15 of them right now. So we have a significant amount of equipment out in the field. Um, our dashboards are out there being used uh, by some of the, ma the largest oil companies in the world. Uh, and now they're being integrated so that we're pulling in uh, the frac companies, all the service companies. They're also using our dashboards um, and right over to the databasing companies. Uh, so the, the Pelotons and the, the, uh, the Pelotons of the world that track and use all the data after the fact, they store it. Um, we're auto-populating databases for the oil and gas companies. So there's a lot of automation happening and removing a lot of the, um, the, you know, the arduous nature of tracking all this data. Um, some of the benefits that we're seeing, I mean, just like I said, if you don't track it, you can't improve it. Well, now we are tracking it. And what's happening is we're getting a lot more visibility into the operation and it's breaking stuff down um, for the operators in ways they haven't thought that it actually would have been happening before. So if they thought that they were taking an average of 15 minutes to do well switches, they're starting to realize that, well, hold on. If we add up all the well switches and draw that summary off cold bore smart pad, it's telling us we have an average of 45 minutes of well switch. Why is that? And so when we dig into it, it starts to reveal itself saying, well, that's because someone in the field was actually categorizing this as well switch, but it's maintenance, right? Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, we need to change that. But the problem was until somebody was able to track all of the data and produce these summaries very easily, you just wouldn't even think to ask the system for that question, right? But when the yeah, summaries are produced, yeah, the summaries are produced right in front of your face. It's very easy to just ask questions and say, well, why that one? And you look through your list and say, well, what about that? Let's dig into that. And you start digging into those. And, you know, that's a that's a big deal. When you start finding half hour on each well switch happens 15 times a day at 10,000 an hour, you know, that's one of probably 40 cases like that. And that's just where high resolution data comes in and starts, you know, really showing the advantages of having it. Do you think that your equipment will become uh, a requirement? as part of regulation for the industry in order to improve it? Um, I think it's really hard to regulate across states, uh, so I doubt it. Um, I think the, where the merit comes from this system, will, it will be, in our hope, is obviously we have a, an edge server that goes on location. And, you know, we're a fairly small Switzerland-style software company. We have a little bit of hardware we hook up to the wellheads, but we provide software that really what it does is it ingests 
all of the other major service companies' data who all use different language. They all gather data differently. They don't, you know, their their problem. The operator's problem is this is all happening, and they all mail in Excel sheets in different formats, right? And so it's really hard to organize and start making any assumptions based on that. And you certainly can't have anything like track engineering software or machine learning uh, doing predictive analytics for you because you're gathering it all manually. So that does not allow for on the fly analytics, right? If you're gathering it manually, it's only studied empirically. And the empirical study, even at that, is is very shallow because it's just too much data for people to pour through and make these assumptions. So I think the adoption of this is going to be fracking. You know, fracking is just quite a bit behind most other industries in terms of using software to really eliminate infrastructure. Um, I kind of, you know, akin it to still sending letters with a typewriter and, you know, we're trying to bring an email system in uh, that's going to have, you know, everyone listen in and everybody can talk instantly all in one spot. All the data is there, everyone can see it, and we can make decisions on the fly rather than mailing a letter back and forth. Um, I, I think this is the change that the industry needs. Now, whether it's us or some other company, um, that's yet to be seen. But the fact of the matter is that they need this IoT software revolution to happen, and it's got to happen pretty quick because people need to find margins outside of squeezing service companies. I can mean to call the company, what the frack? <laughs> Under advisement. You'll be paid a royalty if we do. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't mean to beat it to death, but uh, I always look for surprises, you know. So any, the, you know, the example you gave of uh, mischaracterizing maintenance as switching out a wellhead, that was interesting. Any Anything else? Any last uh, surprises or other interesting data? Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of that stuff that happens. Um, the way that they typically, and I'm going to use uh, terminology that one of the problems with trying to describe all this stuff is I could say, give you one set of examples using terminology, and it's not standardized across the industry. Um, so every company calls it a little different. Uh, so what we're doing is we're, this dashboard is providing a standardized data set that will provide normalized databases, which are very important um, if you're going to be asking for on-the-fly analytics or if you're going to be asking for frack engineering software or even these companies are starting, a few of them are starting to wake up to blockchain-enabled smart contracts because they spend a lot of time moving, uh, you know, dealing with the contract and POs back and forth. If uh, So what they're looking for is a solution in terms of a smart contract that can automate this process. But everyone that they bring in to talk about their smart contracts at these conferences, uh, they start talking about the benefits of a contract in its generality. And really what the problem is, is that the data capture in the field is not there. You cannot populate smart contracts with subjective data that's unorganized. It does not work like that. So one of the big surprises here is that right. implement, implementing this dashboard normalizes databases, and this solves a major back-end problem in terms of the APAR departments with these huge companies like Shell and Exxon and Conoco and BP. Like We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, you automatically end up with a normalized database, which does allow for the uh, smart contracts to be executed. And so they're looking at it in one or two or three different major problems that they'll get to in time. Um, when what we're saying is normalize, you need to, first of all, standardize all the data capture in the field. So we are that, that aggregator box, I guess, if you will, that takes in all the different languages. We put them all in one language. We make sense of it. We drop it all into the databases automatically for them. And then it's ready to be accessed on the back end by whatever different software you want, smart contracts, track software, whatever it is because it's all normalized. So anything you put on the back end that goes to ask the database questions, it knows where to find it. Thus, you can produce results. Right now, because it's all manual and everyone's all over the place doing whatever they want, you cannot implement any software on the back end. So the operators are pulling their hair out trying to figure out where do we start. Um, and I think that one of the magic points of this is we started at the wellhead, we produced the normalized database, and the rest of the problems kind of just start to sort themselves out. Well, this is good. It'll become a competitive advantage for the companies you're helping, and it'll be the stakes to even sit at the table soon. Because, you know, if uh, I have a fracking company that's just manual and yours is automated and tied together and all that, you know, you're going to get much better operating efficiency than me and push me out. So I, I hope that this um, becomes widespread. Yeah, I mean, it's... It the you, yeah you're exactly right it's it's an industry it's, it's it's just well known right like moving to automated systems that are software driven that's not our idea right we just found the application here 
there was a big hole in the market. Um, and I just think it's because the industry is 15 years old and opportunity cost was too high. You know, up until the last three or four years, um, if you have $100 oil and the technology guys running around saying, hey, we have to improve our efficiency, we have to improve our efficiency, no one's even listening to them at the oil and gas companies. They're all going into the land guy's office saying, hey, did you get us more locations? Did you get us more land? We need to move that frack crew. Move it, move it, move it, move it. And so the, the land guy has been the popular guy inside these companies for the last 15 years, pretty much the whole time fracturing's been around. Now, when the downturn happens, no one's in a battle for land anymore. They're trying to figure out how to squeeze more margin out of what they have. And so now the technology guy is the cool guy. It makes sense. How much, uh, do you have any case studies yet? Like how much have you been able to improve efficiency or save money for any particular company? Uh, yeah, we've got multiple multiple case studies that we've anonymized. Obviously, I can't um, cite specific operational uh, gains from any company. But, you know, some of these fracks are millions of dollars. And there's been occurrences within the span of a couple of days where we've saved hundreds of thousands. So it's very uh-huh. unique. Some Some operations are run very smoothly, and this helps with data movement. That's its primary advantage. And some are run less smooth, and this helps out iron out a whole bunch of other problems. Some are visibility, some are infrastructure related. So there's a lot of tangible benefits to a system like this, and there's a lot of intangible benefits to a system like this. And the only way to realize uh, the how to turn the intangibles into tangibles is to gather that data and then start analyzing the data, right? So this system can only yep. go so far until you have to take a look at it and start making operational decisions. Yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, I know you're a tech guy, but at the bottom, at the end of the day, you know, the bottom line is what. Uh, these companies have to look at, but, um, you know, in a downturn, for instance, let's say, you know, my fracking company has this software and it saved money. It'll stay alive longer than other fracking companies that maybe can't sustain the low, you know, oil price. And then it may even allow me to have, uh, takeovers of other companies that are failing because they don't have the, uh, the integration and the technology and they're not efficient. So it opens up a whole bunch of uh, economic opportunities for the whole industry and, and certain companies in it too. That you pre- yeah, exactly. So this, I mean, our our, ma- our main client is the operators, right? We're Switzerland. We come in, provide software that just provides transparency, 100% transparency, and reduces infrastructure to the use of software. That's it. Uh, the benefits are to everybody, right? Everyone wins. So where money was being lost, much to your point, um, was in the misunderstanding of what's happening or the lack of clarity. And so. I'll give you an example. You have an operation going on where there's a bunch of services on location performing a frack for an operator. They're trying to track that operation manually, and they're just saying, well, you know, our guy can only get out there every 15 minutes at the most. So just track it at 15-minute intervals. Don't track everything by the second. It's not possible. Uh, so, But then that trickles down and is a cascading effect into the actual contract. So what they would like to say is, at 10000 an hour, if you cost me 10 minutes, I want you to pay me for those 10 minutes. I want you to pay me every minute. But that's unrealistic because we can't even track it. So now you have these contracts which have all this nebulousness built into them, right? They're saying, well, every half an hour, mm. say you owe us. But okay, what if there's 10 occurrences where they took 23 extra minutes? Well, now you've got 10 occurrences that didn't meet the 30 minute threshold, but that's 230 minutes of wasted time. So it's just like the, the opportunity here is in the resolution of understanding and the clarity and transparency. So conversely, for the mm-hmm. service companies, uh, for the service companies, that lack of clarity was a problem for them because, um, you know, especially frac companies, oil companies would look at th- their downtime and say, oh, well, we think this, you know, we have some downtime here. Uh, frac company, you're the most expensive service out there. Uh, we're going to, you know, that's your fault. Obviously, that's the route they're going to go. And the frac mm-hmm. company doesn't yeah. necessarily always have the data to dispute that. They say, well, no, but then it becomes a matter of opinions, right? And some some consolation happens in the middle where they just agree to disagree and there's a bunch of money lost in not understanding. What we're saying is, here's some sensors, here's some software, you'll know everything down to the second and just let a contract transact the data. You have control over what is transacted, but just let the data make the transactions. So data different, data-driven transactions removes all the fat and the, and the objectivity from this negotiation, takes the wasted money which just goes up in the air and divides it back to each one of those by improving operations and brings cost down. Gotcha. Okay. Well, very good. So, Brett, what's the best way for uh, for people to learn more and to uh, get in touch? Uh, our website, 
coldboardtechnology.com is great. Um, a lot of my contact info, my sales guys are all on there. Uh, you know, we take, we take calls directly. Uh, if it's uh, our service companies or, or large operators, I have no problem. People can reach out to me directly. My email's on there or any of my service uh, people in the U.S. and in Canada. We have uh, headquarters in Calgary, um, the Duke, and in Houston. So, um, you know, soon to be in Midland and uh, probably out in Pittsburgh right after that. Um, so we're, you know, we're kind of all over the place in the major basins and we can have our stuff deployed usually within a week or two once we get the relationship uh, ironed out, not given MSAs and all that. That's great. Okay. Well, very good. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you, my man. I appreciate it. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.